It is Thursday, which means one thing, and that means it's time to check and see uh, which cup of coffee it is with uh, Nico Moreno, our friend from Pulso Sports, El Rolo and W on the Twitters. Is this cup number one, or are you are you on cup number two? This is cup number two, uh, my main man, and uh, hello to everybody down in Atlanta and, well, across the, the country listening to your show, of course. Uh, yes, cup number two. We were up late uh, watching um, the MLS All-Star game because – uh, during the game, I was coaching my daughter, so I didn't get to watch it. And then when I came back, they wanted to watch a movie. So <laughs> there goes dad trying to wait up for everybody to go to sleep so he could watch the game. So uh, definitely L.A. night. So this, this is my second cup. It's actually my second 20 ounce. So I, I should probably slow it down. Well, I mean, just it's all in, it's all in the pacing. It's, it's all in the pacing. It's, it's, it's how, it's how but uh, your big takeaways from and, and this was we got into the discussion with Dylan Butler as well earlier on the network. So I wanted to ask you some of the same things. Your your overarching 30,000 foot cutaway of the, the game itself was what? Um, that. No matter how you want to look at it. You can. See on the field the growth of MLS and how serious Liga MX players, coaches, fans were taking it. There is a pressure that they're feeling and it's not made up. It's not a narrative. They realize that the talent that MLS has in general, they understand that they have looked below MLS in CONCACAF Champions League with the national team. And although this was an exhibition, and yes, it is a money grab for both leagues. The players and, and, and the league itself um, takes it very seriously. So uh, yesterday, uh, Coca was yelling. The fourth official was having to hold him down, make sure that he was staying in place. Uh, when the penalty kick happens, players are angry, coming at the ref. Uh, so th- uh- there's definitely, for me, the biggest take is that this was a very serious game for everybody involved and and now let me let me ask you about the the pk call what what was your thought of the the pk call that led to the second goal for uh, major league soccer Uh, i thought it was there i I thought there was contact uh obviously um uh, uh, i think carlos hill was the one that, that got hit and he sells it well but there's definitely contact uh the defenders late uh, so, yeah, I, I think it's absolute PK. Uh, I, I thought it was interesting that Raul Ridiaz kind of took it upon himself, realizing that the guy who got fouled is not in play. He kind of just gets up there, grabs the ball, and uh, puts it away, which is which is amazing. So where do you think, and Don Garber alerted, alluded to this when it comes to probably the next two all star games, <laughs> Because of where Major League Soccer is with Liga MX and the League's Cup, this almost seems this matchup almost seems like it would get lost in the sauce with what we're seeing with League's Cup. And he intimated that there might be some changes to All Star over the next not just one year, but maybe the next two. What do you think? What does your gut tell you about Major League Soccer's All Star Week? and what we might be seeing because I think that it would get kind of lost in it and it would be just treated as, yeah, it's just another match between Liga MX and MLS. It just so happens that it's a collection of dudes instead of one team against each other. What do you think happens now? Yeah, you know, it's a thought that uh, came to mind and this week following it very closely, it, it was obvious that with League's Cup, it might just seem like too much, right? The, the, the cool thing about this MLS All-Stars against Liga MX all is that it doesn't happen all the time. And uh, it's an exhibition. And, and, and th- there's just uh, a lot um, because it's less, right? Because it, it's something you see all the time. But with a month-long tor- tournament and uh, both leagues going at it and, and players obviously exhausted, yes, th- there probably has to be changes. Um, and I'm not sure how I feel about that. I, I think that the marketing portion of this week is fun. I mean, my son and a couple of his friends uh, were watching the Skills Challenge. That's 
really unheard of. I, I don't remember, uh, you know, my kid ever, you know, being that interested in it, but they almost watched it as if it was the NBA All-Star game that, that, that for me, that All-Star weekend is the best in sports in, in the United States. Um, so I thought that was interesting. So uh, kind of um, trying to aim at, at a younger crowd, the ones upcoming, I think this is important. Skills challenge, making it viral. You know, the crossbar challenge was fantastic. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm really not sure how I feel about it, but I do understand why there might have to be some some changes because of of League's Cup. But I, I honestly would rather keep it this way. But I know there's no stopping that League's Cup, so it's kind of a mute point. Uh, but I hope they don't change too much about it. I, I think they should continue to do this for various reasons that I just mentioned. Okay, so then let me ask you this. How do you keep it separate and fresh and not have it get lost in all of the pages of the competition? I mean, uh, you know, for me, it was great to see Goalie Wars back, but it'd be nice if it was actually on television. Mm -hmm. Um, What do you do to make it separate but equal, if that makes any sense? What do you do? Because I think this is the question that's facing both of these leagues coming up into this thing this is a tough one man it it is a tough one and you know you could say hey maybe use a lot of the younger players like you know the the mls next pro they had their own game and you can maybe use like two-year players or newcomers or whatever but then you don't want it to get diluted the way the slam dunk cost contest per se has gotten diluted because none of the big stars are in it right uh, the, the fun part about this is that those big stars are in these types of games so i i honestly do not have an answer for it uh because what you want to have maybe you change up the, the the way that the teams are voted in and, and you kind of just um try to, to to get a lot of star power for like the starting 11 and then from then on then you could use a lot of younger players uh, but you do want to get those top-notch players in, in in this game. I mean, th- th- this uh, one in particular was was a very good game, uh, but there were some names that you were like, uh, uh, I'm not really sure what that guy is doing up there. Like, I, I don't want to be rude, but uh, Julian Araujo was a guy that I was like, why is he? He's not the best right back by any means. And, and he, he looked out of place at times. Uh, Nagby, no knock to it. I think he's a fantastic player, but you know, I'm, I'm thinking of Pablo Ruiz. I'm thinking of, you know, maybe Salarayan playing there. I mean, it, the, the, there was just, uh, I was lacking a little bit more, more of the, the, the star power, but you know, that's just kind of, kind of the way the, the, the voting goes. Um, uh, so, you know, I think that there'll be a way for, there's enough players in MLS to maybe keep it star studded and then have it, be a little bit separate from that league's cup. Well, and at the same time, I think that you you made a good point where with all the star power, especially with those who come in in the late transfer window like Cucho. Yes. Because, you know, we've seen what he and Lucas Zellerayan have been able to do. Maybe you hold a couple of, of positions back for like late additions and you make it into this big deal. It's like, okay, who's behind the curtain? Who are the late additions? And it's some of those dudes that came in in the window, you know, where you sit there and it's like, okay, Cucho's done fantastic stuff. And you you bring him in as one of those late additions, hold slots back. So you're not sitting there and, you know, having your roster just pushed right to into everybody's, you know, into everybody's face. Here's your roster. And this is what it's going to be. Hold some spots back because there are some guys who have been hanging out over the last couple of weeks who've really made impacts. And you, you have them as a part of the discussion. Yeah, I like that. And you know what? I'm just I'm probably going to get made fun of for this or whatever. But, uh, you know, one thing that I, I liked uh, at times with the NBA is where they just mixed up everybody. So, so how about, you know, having two captains, one M- MX, one MLS, okay. and they just kind of go back and forth and make a, a mixed group of MX and MLS. I mean, if we're trying to just go out of bound and, and think outside the box. I mean, maybe that's something you can do to just make it a little bit different since there's already a, a league's cup. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know what you think about that, but no, that's th- pretty, that could be an idea. That's pretty sweet where you just play pickup and it's like, yeah. and you, you blend the, you blend the, the guys together and you have them like, okay, you really want to throw this against the wall. Here you go. It's like, all right, you're going to make selections and it's just going to be pick them, pick them, pick them, pick them, pick them and go from there. Yeah, yeah, I like it. I mean, you know, imagine a, a, 
uh, Aviles Hurtado dropping in a cross and, uh, you know, Chicharito comes in and smacks it in or Jordan Morris. I mean, that'd be kind of interesting, right? <laughs> Carlos Hill drops it in for Furch. I mean, yeah, I don't know. It might be just different. I'm just, like I said, I'm thinking outside the box. If that that, that it does become kind of an issue and, and I understand why there would be some adjustments made to All-Star Weekend. I like that. So we'll, we'll hang on to that idea. And obviously we'll have this on tape for when they decide the, what they're going to do. Then obviously what we will do is sit there and we'll play the tape back and go, see, here's what Nico said all the way <laughs> <laughs> and and, and we'll spot on. Uh, so now that we've solved all of the all-star issues, let, let's go back to last weekend. And I know that uh, one of the big topics of conversation with the folks on your coast and the folks here in the southeast was the matchup between the two of us. Uh, what were your, your thoughts on uh, Andrew Gutman's absolute lightning bolt making it a 2-1 win? But I know that there were some things that you had reservations for from a Seattle perspective as well. Yeah, I mean, look, it was it was a good win for for Atlanta. A good win shot. There's nothing that Stephen Fry can do. There were some issues in who could have stepped up. Some communication. I thought Danny Leva was a little bit deep. He's a younger guy. Is the 93rd minute? I think active defending kind of broke down after the 92nd. It, it can be a, a normal thing because you're thinking the game is over. But then it all goes back to just having concentration for the entire game. So the shot is amazing. Credit to Atlanta for pushing the ball um, quickly. And and Seattle just continues to drop games by one goal. That's kind of been their MO when dropping games this season. So it all goes back to rotating the midfield and uh, not being concentrated. You know, we talked to Lodero this week and he talked about it. You know, we just we're not playing badly. We just need to continue to stay in games for the entirety of it. It doesn't matter how far it goes. In the 93rd, 94, 96, we, we just got to stay in there. So um, it was a big win for Atlanta. Uh, they they needed it. I, I thought that Seattle was the better team for the majority of, of the game um, over the 90 minutes uh, as a whole. But uh, Atlanta... Uh, very resourceful with some trick plays and uh, just the ability to get guys going. Uh, I wasn't expecting Araujo to play on the left. I think that took Seattle by surprise, just kind of being more of a guy that was involved in just getting to the end line and crossing, maybe simplifying the game a little bit and trying to get um, Jose Martinez uh, a little bit more involved with with some good services. Uh, I continue to say that Cisneros and Jose Martinez can coexist together. I think that you need to continue to throw that out there. Um, unfortunate that Rosetto got hurt. Uh, I love Marcelino Moreno, but there are things that he can do that Rosetto can. Um, so, yeah, all in all, a good win for Atlanta. Tough one for Seattle. Uh, but you could see where both teams uh, continue to progress and where you see potential where they can obviously get into a playoff position. All right. So now that we've got <laughs> The, the week that was behind us, plus uh, MLS, looking at how things stand, uh, the craziness is still the craziness is still crazy. Not a surprise. So going into this weekend standings and, and we'll focus on the crazy here. In the West, Dallas is in third at 36 points. Vancouver is in 11th at 30 points. So you have nine teams separated by six points with either 11, 10, or 9 matches to go. So there's your Western crazy. Eastern crazy, still crazy, no doubt about it. When we're going from 5, and we'll go ahead and include Toronto at 13. So 3, 6, 9 teams in the East, since we had 9 in the West. Mm -hmm. 9 teams in the East, separated by 7 points. And your team in 12th, Atlanta United, only two points out of a playoff spot. You have four teams at 30 points right now in the East. Chicago, Orlando, Inter-Miami, New England. Uh, identical records with Chicago, Orlando City, Inter-Miami. 8-6-10. and 10. So it comes down to goal difference right now with those three. Minus three, minus nine, minus ten. New England has one less win with seven, but they've also played one less match at 23. Charlotte's lost three of four. They're at 29. Atlanta's at 28. And Toronto, who's won two of three since uh, the signings that they have, where they have uh, broken their bank, at least for this month anyway, they're at 26 points. So the crazy is still with us 
Let's go ahead and get into Cliffhanger because that's where we are uh, coming out of All-Star Week. Cliffhanger, once again, the way the rules go, it's the old Price is Right game with, uh, with Nico Moreno here, where we do it this way. I mention games, the occasional juice box if there's some intrigue. We all know how tough it is to win on the road. But if there's a game that Nico wants to talk about when it comes to Cliffhanger, he yells, stop, and we talk about it. Red Bulls in Orlando City, the purple team or Orlando don't, depending on your perspective and who we're talking to. Uh, Red Bulls right now a home favorite at a minus 143. Orlando City North a plus 360. 7.30 Saturday night. Cincinnati hosting Atlanta United at TQL. Cincinnati's a plus 114. Atlanta a plus 209. Your draw is a plus 270. Yeah, stop on that one for me. Hit it. Yeah, that, I mean, that that's a good one. Uh, we were just talking about the importance of Atlanta getting forward and uh, starting to get some points. Obviously, Cincinnati very well placed at six. So it's one of those six point games wins, if you will, for this one. Uh, Cincinnati has, does not have a good record against Atlanta, right? They've only won uh, one time, I believe, out of nine meetings. Uh, so this is a game where Atlanta can push forward, can take advantage of a very open attack with a lot of deficiencies uh, defensively for uh, for Cincinnati. Um, I honestly believe that it could be a momentum shifter for Gonzalo Pineda's group uh, if they can manage to hold defensively. Their, their biggest Achilles heel has been giving up goals early, and this is a very good attack with Brenner and Vasquez and Lucho. So if, if Atlanta can stay concentrated early in the game, keep – Cincinnati from uh, internalizing their soccer and, and completely get Lucho Acosta out of the game, just disconnect them completely from the game. Uh, I think they have a good chance. So that's going to be an exciting one because Cincinnati, I can't believe I'm saying this, has been exciting to watch. Uh, in Atlanta, regardless of injuries, they have the individual talent to make it exciting. I'm watching this one a lot on the line. So um, it, 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 it is an exciting one. Multi-screen experience at 7.30, not including the Revs and D.C. United. Revs are a big favorite at home at a minus 164. Uh, Philadelphia hosting Chicago. Intriguing here. Philadelphia is a minus 137. Chicago is basically a plus 350. But Yeah, let's hold that one. Uh, I mean, that, that, that that's a good game. And Chicago has been impressive. You you, you got to say it. Uh, Shakri starting to look like the Shakri of old. Uh, there seems to be uh, some cohesiveness within that group. Uh, Pineda has completely dominated the, the new midfield position, um, and it just looks good. It, it, it looks uh, good for Chicago. Uh, Philadelphia, despite uh, an odd loss, I think that they're a, an excellent team that can really put things together. We know what Curtin can do. Um, once again, surprised that they lost 3-1 against against Cincinnati. I'm sure that they are going to go into this game with everything they have. Uh, and Chicago on their end, also a difficult loss. I mean, a, dif a difficult win uh, against Charlotte, right? So that, that that's something that uh, these teams are going to be uh, j just kind of ready, on par for. So I'm excited to watch that one. Uh, definitely one that uh, when we talk about those teams kind of on the verge of getting into the playoffs, uh, it, it's an exciting one, right? So um, the, the the key in this one is going to be how much uh, can Chicago do offensively and can they not get uh, out of their game by a very good, very veteran, very physical uh, Philadelphia team? Also, it's uh, Toronto and Portland at 730. I say just take the over in this one. Toronto is a minus 111. <laughs> your, draws, your draws a plus 285 and Portland's a plus 265. But uh, since I went ahead and volunteered that as a particular juice box alternative, uh, two and a half is a minus 181. Three and a half is a plus 135. Four and a half is a plus 309. So those are your numbers. Once again. Yeah, but th th this is a good one too, man. I mean, uh, Toronto is another team that's been fun to watch and at BMO Field and uh, with a insignia that is starting to remind some of 
uh, the atomic ant. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they're old Italian uh, with with a beautiful shot from outside. So you know, I, I get where they're coming from. Uh, but Toronto looks good, uh, although despite. Um, what most may think of, of what really grabbed my attention. Uh, I thought Jonathan Osorio getting two goals was was important. Uh, he's been a leader uh, for this team. He's someone that once he gets going, uh, the, can really affect the team uh, in a different aspect, right? From from that mutual position on the outside, um, kind of his ability to uh, Create an association with uh, Bernadeschi on that end uh, is something that if he can get going, uh, it's going to be great. Uh, that said, defensively, a lot of question marks. Uh, Nashville's course three, uh, which we've talked about Nashville and their issues, mm -hmm. uh, but don't get too excited. You know, from run of play, there wasn't much. It was a PK, a couple of set pieces, um, but it just still brings the question of Toronto. Can they keep it together? Are they going to just go out here and just try to duke it out completely without any defense ever against every team? So that's why I, I'm, I'm excited to watch this one. Portland is always a difficult team. They're always balanced. So it, it is a, it is a good line to see where Toronto really is at uh, going against the, uh, you know, MLS grade, if you will. Also at uh, eight o'clock inter Miami hosting NYC in Fort Lauderdale inter Miami is basically a plus 200 as a row, as a home dog, uh, nine o'clock Eastern got a couple of matches, Austin and sporting Austin, big favorite at home. No surprise rapids and crew, uh, at uh, nine o'clock with the Prairie dogs in commerce city, Colorado's an even money plus a hundred Columbus is a plus two fifty. FC Dallas, they're at home, so that to me means that they're probably going to beat San Jose as a plus 157. San Jose on the road is, is pretty hideous. Right now they're a plus 370. Houston, one of the three teams I think in the West that we right now can eliminate from the playoff discussion. They host CF Montreal. They're a home favorite, not by much, at a plus 145, plus 174 for CF Montreal. Galaxy and Whitecaps, this one is interesting because you don't know which LAG team you're going to get. They're at home. They're a big favorite. Vancouver's a plus 418. The Galaxy are a plus or a minus 167. LAFC and Charlotte. LAFC obviously a big favorite at home as they should be. 10:30 on Saturday night. Sunday game. Yeah, well, this. Go ahead, hit it. Yeah, we could talk about the Galaxy. You know, and and and, and a game against Vancouver that uh, could mean a lot, uh, uh, at least for the LA Galaxy's hopes and dreams. Uh, now that they've been revived by. Uh, the acquisition of Ricky Puig uh, for many. Uh, I am still very cautious. Uh, I think that is going to take this team a lot of time to get away from their dependency in what Robinson uh, used to do in the midfield. Uh, Javier Hernandez look excited, look good in this uh, all-star week. And uh, I think that's important for, for a, a player to get his mind off of what's going on, just reset everything. Um, and he's coming from a, a two-score game against Kansas City. So, you know, can Javier Hernandez become that guy and, and just um, really create a um, duo uh, with Jovelich? Is that going to be enough for a very light, very diluted central midfield? I mean, there's just so many questions for me there. Uh, I know uh, Mikey Delgado uh, is a good player, but he's just not someone that's going to be able to cover a lot of space. And when I look at that bench, man, I just, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not excited about it. So uh, it's going to be a good one. Uh, I, I want to uh, see what, what uh, sort of adjustments uh, Greg Vanny can make in this one. So I, I'm excited to watch it. All right. Sunday games are actually pretty uh, interesting when it comes to Palace Intrigue. Nashville at home, hosting Minnesota. Mm. Nashville is a minus 140. Mm -hmm. Minnesota is almost a plus 290 here. But ever since Nashville moved into Geotis, they're not the same team that was at Nissan. And maybe you can contribute it all the way back to the Open Cup. They haven't been the same since Open Cup. Still trying to figure out who they are offensively. Even with Hani Mukhtar, he's not getting any support. And this is not the Nashville team that we've seen in the past. Nashville right now a home favorite, but it's Minnesota United. An interesting matchup here at Geotis. 
Well, could you remind me those numbers uh, for Nashville, and Minnesota? Nashville's a minus 114 in the composite. Your, okay. Your draw is a plus 267. Minnesota United a plus 288. Wow. Mm-hmm. I, I, I might take Minnesota on this one. I, I mean, look, um, uh, Minnesota, as we've talked about, there's a lot of disbalances. That Colorado game should tell you everything you need to know about Minnesota. Good offensively, Amarillo with a beautiful goal, but then <laughs> Minnesota gets caught in a long throw in and Barrios all kinds of space. Um, and something that it should be concerning for Minnesota is the maybe I'm being too harsh here, but there were there have been some rare mistakes from St. Clair at goal. And it wasn't just this game, just over the past few games. I'm not sure if it's a lack of confidence or, or what it is. But but in in the last game against Colorado, a couple of goals were on him. And he was kind of that go-to for them that would just, if you knew something on Minnesota was that you were good at goal. Uh, so he's going to have to really get it together. Maybe this All-Star weekend will do it for him. Um, so there's question marks on both ends. But I think offensively, they have enough to really make uh, this Nashville team um, panic, right? And, and you you said it right after uh, having 24 game run of, of not losing at home. Uh, they have lost uh, three of their last six at home. So it's not looking good for Nashville. Uh, so a lot of question marks that could be answered on this one. But if I had to take someone, I'm going to take the underdog uh, with Minnesota and I'm a bet on uh, a Minnesota team that that at least on the offensive end has found some consistency uh, and they 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 found the goal score that they wanted in uh, Luisa Maria and uh, Babello obviously is the guy that makes it all happen uh, for Gapane uh, doing his thing. So, yeah, I mean, it's going to be a good one. I, I would put some money on Minnesota for this one. Then your last one is yours. Seattle hosting RSL. Seattle obviously at home favored a minus 108. RSL is a plus 280. What are you looking at for the Sounders after uh, the Atlanta match rebounding at home? Yeah, this is going to be a big game for Seattle. There's no doubt about it. We haven't talked to Brian's message just yet, but I would call it a must win. Um, at this point in time, I know that you look at the standings and you feel like uh, – you're not far away from it, and this team has always been in the playoffs, but it, it has to be more than that. It, it has to be about the morale. It has to be about gaining some momentum, and, and now is the time. You had a, the, the break of All-Star Weekend, to me, tells me it's the last push for your team to get it together. So the way you start this week is going to be important. RSL has given Seattle a lot of grief. They've Eliminated him from last year's playoffs. They lost at Rio Tinto this year, 1-0. Uh, they just seem to have their numbers. So when I spoke to Ladero, I could see that he wasn't having it. He, he did not like the fact that I brought up this facts. He <laughs> he wants to change that storyline, right? Uh, and uh, RSL is coming from a loss against LAFC, but they're a very good team. Uh, we've talked about him constantly uh, from – how they have planted themselves in midfield to some of that uh, offensive power that they've been able to gather. So it's it's going to be a good game, man. At home, 7 o'clock game, like you said, prime time, baby. So they're going to have to really show up for this one. Uh, I see the desire in this uh, training practice I went to. Uh, like I said, we didn't talk to uh, Brian, but you can tell that there's a lot of intensity. There was a lot of coaching. There was a lot of Freddie uh, Juarez uh, in there just talking to the guys. Uh, so, you know, this is a big one for them. I, I think this is going to be an exciting game. Uh, but once again, Seattle has to be very careful with this RSL team. They're not the RSL team of old. Uh, I think Julio up top is interesting. Savarino coming back. Uh, Sergio Cordova is a guy that can be streaky and can be a little inconsistent. But when he's on, he's on. So this Seattle team has to be very careful with RSL. And then 12 teams go from the weekend and go into the midweek. L.A. and D.C. actually go Saturday, Tuesday. And the LAFC plays D.C. at the bank on Tuesday. And then you got five matches on Wednesday. Atlanta United hosting Red Bulls, Toronto hosting the Rebs, NYC hosting Charlotte, Dallas hosting Philly, Vancouver, and Colorado. Before Friday night football next week, Seattle has to go to LAG and Dignity Health Sports Park. 
interesting stuff in the midweek. And the context may change from what we see in the weekend with those 12 teams as they play on Tuesday and Wednesday. Oh, yeah. We're going to change the storyline because one of the good things is that by the time Seattle starts the game, they're going to have a good gauge on where the standings are at. That's the privilege of being the last game of the of the week. But, yes, uh, immediate change when it comes to Tuesdays and Wednesdays games. Uh, a, a lot on the line there um, in, in terms of, like, FC Dallas playing, um, Colorado that I continue to say is a, a team that you need to watch out if you're trying to make it to the playoffs in the West. So, yeah, it, it, it's going to be exciting how, how all that plays out uh, during the week. And then Seattle getting ready for – uh, a league galaxy team that despite some issues they're always dangerous uh, at least up top and, and seattle likes to take it very uh th- i wouldn't say that there's a rivalry against the la galaxy but they enjoy feeling like they have some sort of uh, dominance over this team uh at times so it, it's going to be a good one time for the promo what's going on with you and pulso sports well, um, actually, uh, Garth Lagerway will be talking at training field in maybe three hours, uh, uh, depending on when you drop this. Um, so today we're going to have some um, conversations with Garth Lagerway, just asking him about the transfer window. Obviously, he going by and Seattle not quite doing anything right now. Uh, talk to him about the future, what's coming up, uh, Club World Cup, and, you know, are there any plans to, as I think that they will, bring in a couple of big guns or at least one uh, to this team for that specific tournament. So definitely stay on tune for that. We're going to have that probably up by 1 p.m. Pacific time. What he said, El Rolo and W on the cup of coffee. It's Thursdays with Nico. My friend, Thanks for uh, giving us the West Coast perspective and the Nico Moreno perspective. As always, we will catch up next week, my friend. Thank you for standing me and listening to me and having me on your great show, my friend.